Hello once again and welcome back to Spider-Man Dissembled. Welcome back, everybody. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Let's talk about Secret Invasion Spider-Man numbers 1 through 3 by Brian Reed and Mario Santucci. Then let's also talk about The Amazing Spider-Man Annual 2008 by Mark Guggenheim and Mike McCone. These are both included in the trade Spider-Man Secret Invasion or Secret Invasion Spider-Man, whatever. So for the Secret Invasion Spider-Man, I'm actually uh, kind of looking forward to this because it's by Brian Reed, and I, I like Reed stuff overall, so so I'm, I'm kind of excited for this. Yay! First of all, just want to say the fact that Joe Robertson is a streetcar racer, which has never come up before, is hilarious. Spider-Man is off with the Avengers in the Savage Land for Secret Invasion, and that's why he isn't here for this whole Secret Invasion 1 through 3. Which, like, <laughs> speaking of Secret Invasion, I don't even know if I, I... I think I read the entire thing. I read far enough anyway to get to the point where there's this brilliant point where essentially, you know, there's this big fight going on in the Savage Land. Nobody knows who's a scroll or who's not. Reed comes to his senses. He's been down and out for different reasons. He comes to his senses, and he creates this gun which will reveal who's a scroll and who's not. And he shoots it at everybody and so suddenly every scroll is revealed and so the guys who aren't scrolls fight the ones who are and they take him down and there's just this sea of whoever's left remaining one of them spider-man who still has on his mask so how does anybody know he's not a scroll nobody ever says anything it's not brought up they don't force him to at least peel off his mask a little bit and show that he's got what you know white or black or whatever skin rather than green so i wonder if reed had the same issue i mean i'm assuming i i don't really know exactly when reed was writing this as opposed to when secret invasion was coming out or if he was even privy to any of Bendis's Secret Invasion scripts, but I but I wonder on the off chance if Reed had some of the same issues that a Michael did with that. Because here in this first issue, while Jackpot's fighting the scroll that looks like Spider-Man, she's like, why are you dressed like him? And he's like, dress? Scroll warriors are shapeshifters. What need do we have for clothes? And so, you know, and then he kind of turns his face scroll like So I guess maybe insinuating that if Peter Parker was a scroll, then that ray would still have worked because he would have shaped shifted and because the costume was really just his skin which is you know I, I don't really think that's the case is because that's kind of weak because if I remember right with Secret Invasion most of the Skrulls were sleeper agents and even, did not even know that they were Skrulls so presumably he would still be wearing his costume like literally wearing a costume which makes me think that Reed was maybe trying to cover some bases there a little bit so I, I don't know maybe. The Skrull Invasion is this perfect get out of jail free card for basically almost every book in one way, shape, form, or another. They could have had this Spider-Man be a scroll, and it could have been revealed that the Spider-Man who made the deal in one more day was in fact a scroll, and therefore Mephisto screwed up, and now the real Spider-Man's back, and we deal with the story of him finding out that, that everything has changed because of a deal that he didn't even make involving himself and Mary Jane. There's also the possibility of, like, if they thought bringing back Gwen with Brand New Day didn't work and it would have been too much of a screw you to the fans, they could have brought her back on the spaceship with the scrolls. I wonder if they were tempted by any of this at all. You know, I wonder if it even crossed their minds or if it was just kind of like, oh, scrolls are invading, we gotta deal with that somehow. And, you know, it was just kind of written off. I'm gonna assume the latter since it was farmed out to Brian Reed who doesn't normally work on Spider-Man. But I, I would be really curious to know the inner workings at the Spidey office at that point. Were they at all tempted? I'm not exactly sure when this came out, but they've been doing Brand New Day for at least six months at this point. And seeing the drop in sales and seeing the kind of lukewarm reception, etc., 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 I really wonder if they were tempted to use this as their big get out of jail free. I want to know if there were any talks with Quesada saying, hey, look, can we use this to get out of it? And if we use this to get out of it, then it doesn't really negate the One More Day story which I'm assuming Quesada at least would not want to do because it's such a out of left field sort of thing. Part of me really thinks that they had no intention ever of using a Secret Invasion as a get out of jail free for one more day. And, and I mean, you know, one reason for that is because it would totally make Mephisto be clown shoes. I, I mean, I'm sure there's ways they easily could have written around it, but as at face value, if the Peter Parker that makes the deal with Mephisto is really a scrawl and Mephisto follows through with this, then it really makes Mephisto seem dumb. Like, oh, that was an alien who's soul, uh, or not soul, but that's an alien who I was talking to and all that. Oh no, I, I knew that, guys. Ha ha, the joke's on you. I'm 
evil, ha ha ha, you know? And so I really kind of just don't think that that was, that was part of the plan. I think it is more likely that they were wanting the reader to believe that this was going to end up being some type of a get out of jail free card. You know, I, I, I don't, since I didn't really read any of the Secret Invasion stuff myself, I'm not sure how well that carried out. But I, I think that they were probably wanting the reader to be like, oh, this could be the, you know, this could really have been a scrawl, and da 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 da, it wasn't, and that was supposed to be the surprise, was that it was not a scrawl. But then again, to my knowledge, I mean, the... As Michael said, Secret Invasion could have been a get-out-of-jails-free card for a lot of different things. Civil War amongst them, and I really don't think Secret Invasion did any of it. Like, I can't think of a situation off the top of my head, and like I said, mind you, I didn't read it, but I can't think of a situation off the top of my head that they actually used the scrolls for to say, like, oh, no, 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 the reason that Steve was acting weird in Civil War, or no, 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 the reason Reed was acting weird in Civil War was, I don't think they ever did that. It's like, Secret Invasion Invasion brought back Mockingbird, which makes me happy because I love her. But that's really all I can think of, so I don't know. I Maybe I should go back and read that. So it starts off with Dexter Bennett, Betty Brandt, Vin, and Joe Robertson racing from a Jackpot Super Scroll fight. We find out the Jackpot's after Walter Declan? <laughs> Didn't Wolverine kill him during Civil War? I want to put a little asterisk and do, like, editor's note. See every friggin' episode of Acts of Treason that Jason and I did revolving around Wolverine. I think that Declan was a, a scrawl, the one from Civil War. I say this with a deadpan face. So the DB is apparently saying some semi-mean things about Jackpot. She randomly gets a union rep who is crazy. New Spidey loves their crazy comic relief character. I actually think the union rep thing was a brilliant idea, you know, a registered superhero having a union rep kind of forced upon him, especially an insane one that just is nuts. I don't know, I really dig the idea of that whole thing escalating out of Jackpot's control, but not in like this crazy melodramatic way, but just kind of in this crazy funny way. Which oddly enough means I think that that union rep probably so far has been my favorite supporting cast member we've seen in the new Spidey stuff. This kind of plays like a wackier Secret Invasion frontline, but with all the supporting cast getting screen time. Jackpot seems to have the Parker luck. Yeah, indeed she does have the Parker luck, and I don't know, maybe I'm just geeking out on Brian Reed doing this, but he just seems to be pulling it off really well. It, it's the actual honest Parker luck, not the making Peter Parker look like a horrible person type of Parker luck like they've been doing in the core book. Fun little side note, side gag here. A Manhattan police code for a Galactus sighting? FF48. And there's a Spidey scroll. It's fairly ridiculous overall, but it's a fun read. I guess I must be wrong about Lily being Menace, because we see Lily unconscious, and the next page, Menace shows up. So, unless Lily gained consciousness, ran away from Harry, who was conscious during that time, knocked him out, perhaps, found a goblin stash, I guess she can't be Menace. So that sucks, but that's okay. Uh, I will have a new guest soon. So obviously not Harry. Harry is the ridiculously obvious choice. Not gonna go for Harry. Not sure who else it would be. Maybe Lily's dad? I, I don't know. I really thought it was Lily. The only other alternative is that nobody told Brian Reed that Lily is Menace, and he just wrote it as if she wasn't, which would be really, really sad, guys. I mean, come on. Though, regardless of whether or not Lily is or is not Menace, within the Spider-Man history, there is precedent to one writer not being privy to whom somebody else is. You know, like, for instance, the Hobgoblin when they killed Ned Leeds in a Spider-Man Wolverine one-shot, you know, even though Leeds was supposed to be the Hobgoblin. Goblin, so I mean there's totally precedent for that, sad as it may be. The Super Scroll deduces that Betty is Spider-Man, which is pretty amusing. We get the line, they finally did it. They trashed the car. The jackpot retraction is issued as a crossword clue, which is nice. That's just one of those moments where it's like, that's so brilliant. There's so many just great, wacky, over-the-top moments in here that totally showcase the character. I love the crossword clues. Just like looking through all of them are just, you know, kind of fun. And of course, you've got your Colbert thing that they're still, you know, harping on with this. But yeah, Reed is just, wow. Oh my god, I wish Brian Reed were part of the Brain Trust. Why isn't he part of the Brain Trust? He so gets it. He gets how to write this title. He gets the humor and how to do it in a way that doesn't fall flat and isn't 
stupid. I mean, and it's a great example for how well, you know, Brian Reed just gets this, is that little exchange at the end between Jackpot and Spider-Man. She's like, why do I talk to you? And he's like, because I like redheads. And she's like, wait, what? And he's like, uh, I answered that question backwards. I mean, that was just brilliantly done. It was just great. Brian Reed, please come save us. In general, I, I'm not a big Jackpot fan, not like Michael is. Like, I don't dislike her at all, but she just hasn't really done anything for me. But not only has, like, Reed totally sold me on Jackpot, I mean, it's like, this is what a Spider-Man comic should be. This It's really just kinetic and moving and fun and zingers and the supporting cast, like, all of them just have these great moments. It's like, I... Except for, well, even I, I, I even hate Vin a little less in this book than normal just because he's well written even though he's still kind of a jerk. Yeah, this is BAM! Yeah, Reed, I love you, man. I totally love you. So as a note, uh, now on to the annual 2008. It and the trade paperback use the same cover and it's creepy. It makes Jackpot look like a spider penis. So apparently Jackpot can fly now. Uh, I don't remember that. Wasn't she like hopping onto a truck and stuff? I, all right. I really, really enjoy the Spider-Man jackpot interaction, and I really hope that she sticks around for years and years to come, because I absolutely love this character. And let's go ahead and talk about something. I said I would talk about this when we got to the reveal. Both Jason and I have talked about this privately before, and I'm sure he'll have his own two cents to add on this. But let me just say this. Here's why teasing Jackpot as Mary Jane is stupid. I'm going to use the analogy of the final season of Lost. If you haven't seen Lost, just bear with me. Problem with the final season of Lost is we get these flash sideways that aren't explained until the very end. Now, the explanation for the flash sideways makes perfect sense, absolutely fits with the story and the tone of where the story was going. But there is an alternate red herring explanation introduced much earlier in the season, and it's a slightly more obvious explanation. And that explanation is 10 times more interesting and provided 10 times the story opportunities. This is a problem that arises when you want to do a mystery story and you want to leak out the clues bit by bit by bit over time. You cannot have your final mystery, no matter how solid and sense-making it might be, be less interesting and provide fewer story opportunities than your red herrings. A slightly more obscure reference is the second season of When They Cry, the anime, which is this brilliant, brilliant first season of an anime, has uh, all these possibilities and you're wondering what the hell is going on, and then second season comes around and the first little one-parter kind of like talks about all of the uh, conspiracy theories, and it's a really fun episode, and it brings up like four or five really intriguing possibilities, and then there's all the stuff that I and my friends had talked about while we were watching it, and then it's like, nah, it's just Groundhog Day, whatever. <laughs> it's like, well, why the hell should I care? I've seen Groundhog Day. Way to ruin a series, guys. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, this is the problem with Jackpot, is that if we were at all fooled by her, the possibility that she might be MJ, which I don't think anybody was, were they? All that does is bring up all these interesting possibilities. How did MJ get powers? Was it from the deal with Mephisto? Why did she choose that if that was what she chose to whisper to Mephisto? Does she remember everything? The fact that in Peter Parker Paparazzi, she seems to pretty firmly be in L.A. seems to kind of dispel those myths. But up to that point, we have tons of questions about, oh, and I guess she gives her name as Sarah Errett, but, I mean, she could be lying. The problem is you go for like three months or whatever it is thinking, or at least they want you to be thinking, this could be MJ. What's the mystery here? Well, it's not MJ. And the mystery, once it's revealed, while interesting, I mean, it works and it's interesting. And honestly, I would have liked to have seen a lot more done with it. It's kind of completely and totally two characters who we've never seen before and will probably never see again. And we don't really have any reason to care about. Whereas MJ, you know, we've known for like 25, 30 years. We have reason to care about her. We have reason reason to care about what happened with one more day and it's like no you're not gonna get any more information on that sorry wah wah so as fulfilling as this explanation is it's a feint a sidestep and that's what's frustrating about and aside from everything that Michael just said, I think one of my personal problems with the jackpot mystery is I never really felt like it was a mystery. I mean, like, you know, Menace is a mystery. Hobgoblin is a mystery. The Rose is a mystery. The jackpot stuff was a subplot. That That's how I felt. I was never just, like, biting my nails being like, who is jackpot? Because we know it's not Mary Jane. And since they never really bothered to give you anything else to work with, 
it just wasn't a mystery, you know? It was it was a non-issue for all intents and purposes. Essentially, the very basic way of explaining the jackpot mystery, if you don't remember or whatever, or if you're listening to these to find out the plots of these old Spider-Mans, which you're probably way more than lost by now. There's this chick who has powers. She registers, but is like, I don't want to be a superhero. This woman comes to her and says, like, I really want to make a difference. I want to do something good. I'm going to take mutant growth hormone and take your place and go join the initiative. Is that cool? She's like, sure, whatever, fine. So she does. That's Jackpot. And that's why Sarah Errett, who's the woman with powers, doesn't know what Spidey's talking about because it's really Alana something and she's using Sarah Errett's name and uh, power base to be a superhero. So Reed Richards in here uses hoofbeats as an example rather than Occam's razor for talking about the simplest explanation must be the most correct. Really? Hoofbeats? You know, I'm not... I don't know, something something about the exchange between Reed and Spidey just kind of rubs me the wrong way. You know, so Reed's crazy brainy smart, we know that. I mean, it's friggin' Reed Richards, but you know, Peter Parker's not dumb. I mean, he's brainiac boy himself, and I know that he cracks wise a lot, obviously, because that's part of his motif, but wow, it, it, it's hard to explain, because it's not like Reed ever talks down to Peter during the scene. He, he never does, but he references things that I really think that Spidey would know and would pick up on and wouldn't need to have explained to him, like when Reed's saying about, you know, I believe the diagnostic axiom regarding hoofbeats would apply in this particular case, you know, I would expect that Spidey would say, ah, you mean when you hear hoofbeats, think zebras, not, or think horses, not zebras, but instead, it, you know, Reed has to explain that to him, and, you know, it just, it just feels off. Yeah, I, I get what, I get what Guggenheim's trying to do here, he's trying to be like, you know, Reed is awesome, Reed is smart, yay Reed, but it just is kind of coming off at the deficit of Spidey being smart himself. I just totally think that scene could have been written a lot better. Also, Reed, Superhero Registration Act Progenitor Richards, and Spider, number one most wanted member of the outlawed Avengers man, are just hanging out, chilling? That's cool then? I guess they made up during that time that Spidey and the, uh, I, I think the rest of the new Avengers were off in the Savage Land fighting the Skrulls alongside all the people who wanted to arrest them. The conversation between Peter and Reed in the Savage Land where they kind of make up would have been an awesome little side story, just the two of them being like, yeah, ooh, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Yep. Do you want to talk about it? No. Yeah. Me neither. <clears throat> all right, well... See you in New York? Absolutely. You know, it's just whatever. Uh, again, you know, the whole Superhuman Registration Act is just, it's only touched upon when it needs to be. I mean, and, and it gets really... I I mean, it's frustrating in general, but it's definitely more frustrating in issues like this where they're dealing with the Superhuman Registration Act. They're dealing with why Jackpot did what she did and how she did it and, you know, between her and Sarah and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like that's a part of it. And then just to blatantly have, like, Reed and Spidey hanging out just with nothing at all just... Oh, uh, I mean, I don't really see why the two of them should be at odds. They've known each other, even if Reed doesn't remember who uh, Spider-Man is, they've known each other for quite a long time, and so I, I can understand, you know, when Reed's not written like a Nazi like he was in Civil War, I can understand those two just kind of getting along, buddy-buddy, whatever. I mean, that makes sense. I'm good with that. But it's just frustrating that they just keep trying to have both the left and the right and be happy with that, you know, both the cake and eating it too, when instead they, they shouldn't. It's just... It's it's crazy. It's crazy, I say. So Wolverine did kill Walter Declan, but he's okay? Walter Declan is apparently like the Marvel version of Major Force? And at the end, oh, it sickens me even talking about this. They kill Alana. They seriously kill Alana. Just when she was starting to get really interesting. Seriously. Spidey is racking up an impressive number of dead women, by the way. You know, and not only did they kill her, they killed her in a pretty lame way. I mean, ugh, it's, it's, okay, let's just boil this down. The whole point to this death, let's just be honest here, is to be like, okay, kids, you know what's bad? 
drugs. Drugs are bad because when you take one drug and mix it with another drug, you could die. That's what's wrong. Drugs are bad. So it's just really frustrating that they kill a character, which is finally starting to get interesting because I've never, like I said, I've never been a huge Jackpot fan. But between Brian Reed's Secret and Invasion arc, where she was awesome, and then this, where they're actually doing some entertaining, you know, like this whole duality between Alana and Sarah Errett, you know, it's just like there, there's some interesting stuff. We can actually play with it now. And then they kill her just to do some type of of, you know, like public service announcement. Wow, it's lame. Totally lame. I was so excited to see more with Alana. I love the Spidey Jackpot interaction, and I really thought, oh, hey, what they're trying to do here, because, you know, they're doing so many throwbacks to old school stuff, is they're trying to do Spidey and the Prowler. Remember Hobie Barnes, or whatever his name was? Hobie the Prowler, where Spider-Man was basically like, kid, you can't do this, you're gonna get killed. Like, I have powers, etc., etc., etc. But then he would keep having to, like, call him in for different reasons. I totally thought that's what they were gonna do with Jackpot. Like, we would see Jackpot try to be Jackpot without powers now, and, you know, I don't know, maybe be in a hospital for a few months, whatever. So many story opportunities here, and they just chucked him out the window in favor of killing another chick on Spidey's watch. So disgusted and disappointed by the ending of that. Yep, totally, totally disappointing. Ah. Uh, <sighs> ah. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say on that, because it really is just so upsetting. Thanks for cutting that storyline short, guys. I don't know if this was planned from the beginning, or if this was just like, boy, people really aren't digging jackpot, let's just get rid of that. I, I just think this could have been handled so much better. So much better. And on that note, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Thanks for joining us. Spider-Man Dissembled.